Hello and welcome back. I'm here with Chris Allen, Principal Software Engineer at Zorp, who focuses on systems and performance. He is going to talk to us today about performance engineering. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to demonstrate today was the tracing kit that we are adding to uh, the Noxchain stack. Um, we've had tooling for tracing and performance profiling, um, both in the open source and uh, in our internal stuff for a bit now. But this is a significant upgrade. So traditionally, if we wanted to measure performance and see where we're spending time, uh, be it validating blocks or uh, proof attempts for trying to mine a block, we basically had a split where we would use native stack tooling like Sampley for seeing the Rust side of the profile story. And then separately, we would dump uh, JSON traces from NOCVM. And what we have now is much more flexible. It's also pl a pluggable backend. So you can actually integrate other tracing backends, but we think that the tracy backend that I'm going to demonstrate here in a minute will be compelling enough that people will be happy with it. And apart from the tracy profiler being much nicer, this is the, uh, I'm going to show you the the profiler we're talking about here. So it was actually developed by game developers, but you can just kind of use it for anything, Windows, Mac, or Linux. And it is a very compelling piece of software. It's extremely nice. So with it integrated, um, currently the way the integration works is you need to enable tracing in the build. You need to pass an argument asking for the tracing tracing mode, because we still have the legacy JSON backend in there available for people who prefer it. Um, I don't think so once they try this. I don't think they'll care once they see this. But you know, it's it wasn't going to cost us anything and just leave it in there. And um, then you pass an environment variable to enable the tracing. One of the things I figured out as I was integrating this, because this started with uh, a patch contributed by the community, actually is I figured out how to make it run in on-demand mode. Now, what's particularly special about that is you're not eating the cost of the profiling. You can leave the integration on, and it makes it so that you can dip into a running instance at any time live and just take a look. So the instance that we're actually testing this with is one of our Backbone servers, um, Backbone US South, and that when it's called a backbone, what it means is it's basically a peer, just like the open source client. But it's one of the peers that we run for bootstrapping the network. So when somebody fires up a knockchain client, they're connecting through the DNS record to one of these backbone servers. People are connected to the server right now. And I'm going to be profiling it live. So I've already deployed the version with tracing enabled. The configuration has tracing enabled. And um, you don't really want to expose this to the open network. So I'm going to be using an SSH tunnel, uh, just a loop back to securely connect to the uh, remote instance. And um, we'll put up documentation. I'm not going to get into the weeds on exactly how to configure it and enable it in this presentation, but we'll have documentation for that when we uh, release the final version of this in open source. But it's it's basically done. I could probably just merge it right now. So by SSHing the server in this manner with the uh, dash capital L command, I'm mapping the local port 8086 to my local port of 8087. And you can see the profiling uh, server right there. What's neat is it doesn't actually record in the trace data so that you don't run out of RAM until you actually connect to it and you're not eating uh, most of the cost of tracing or profiling the service until you actually connect to it. Uh, locally, I have the Tracy Profiler client running. And um, to start profiling, I just connect to it. And you can see it downloading data. In a moment, we're gonna start seeing frames pop up here. And it is streaming in live. And traditionally, the way you uh, 
the way you do this is you connect, you decide when you feel like you have enough data, that you're seeing enough information, that you've covered the things that you care about. Um, currently, we're getting a lot of Tokyo, a little bit of Surf. Um, the Surf is the actual uh, thread that runs the, the NOC VM. And you can see the poke right there. I'm going to zoom out a little bit, see where we're at. I want a few more pokes, and then we'll stop it. Probably stop at about a minute of data. Yep, there we go. There's a save to jam checkpoint. That's good. There's another poke. All right, we're going to call that good. I'm going to stop it. Save the trace. I usually just save it in my documents. We'll call this uh, Backbone US South 1. Save the trace. OK. So part of what's special about this is you now have unified profiling and tracing with the Hoon side and not VM side by side with the native side. right? So each of these tracks here are the threads that are running on the server. And if I go to statistics, you see instrumentation and sampling here. So <clears throat> the sampling is sampling the stack, the native stack. So that's where you're going to see the Rust code here. right? And then instrumentation is anything that's been instrumented with the tracing uh, library, which is a very common and popular library for uh, logging and tracing and spans and all kinds of stuff. If you use Datadog APM with Rust, you're probably using tracing. Right. And um, what's nice is you can add the same instrumentation. It's it's baked into the NOC VM uh, when you enable this tracing integration automatically. So all of the uh, Hoon function calls, you'll see them show up here. But you can also add it to the uh, Rust side if you want to track something specific that you're interested in. And what's nice is it shows you these timings on the right hand side here. So it shows you the total time you spent under a particular span. And then it shows you the counts. And then it shows you the mean time per call. So a good example of where that gets a little bit weird is if you see next effect, the total time is 49 milliseconds, but the counts are 40,596. 40, so your mean time per call is only 1.21 microseconds. So it's really only a factor, not even necessarily a significant one, just because of the sheer number of times it gets called. That's fine. That's We expect that. You can also tell that it's on the Rust side because if you look at location, you see how it has like crates, knock app, noun, knock app, driver, knock app, save. If you see a dot RS, it's Rust, right? This one right here, digest to Atom, that's actually from the knock VM. And you can tell because it has a path that uh, goes through the Hoon modules and then it has, you know, individual arms or maybe a module wrapped around some function arms and things like that. And then if we open. To jam checkpoint, you can see more stats on it. There's not a whole lot because we didn't get a lot of samples of it, but um, you can actually correlate the groups and see, like, okay, here's the number of times it ran. Here's the time per the execution time each time it got called. It gives you a group mean, group medium. Um, total zone group time. You can also restrict it to a specific span of time if you want. Um, if we go to the sampling side, actually, sorry, let me go back to instrumentation. Let me do timing with children. So timing with children is handy because it'll include, it'll aggregate the times of all the child spans under the span so that you can kind of see it, the time spent in your code in a hierarchical fashion, right? And we'll be able to do the same thing with the samples and we'll look at them in a moment. Um, so yeah, if we look at <clears throat> save, you can see we have a save interval for saving the checkpoints for um, the durable state. And then we go over to sampling, um, and we go back to self only. So you can see, okay, so we spent uh, more time in nouns lab copy into, knock VM preserve. And this is all pretty much going to be uh, native code. The, um, the knock VM interpreter does show up in the uh, samples, but it's it's not as illuminating as having these uh, instrumentation spans for the actual that actually tell you like which 
whom function was being interpreted or executed, right? Um, you can actually see Tracy stuff show up here. You can exclude that if you want, but it uh, it's generally not a huge factor in performance, especially if you have enough threads to cover the background threads for Tracy. Then you can see like some of our time is spent in int map, increasing the cache, uh, checking for running out of memory in the knock VM, right? And you can see like which parts of it we spent the most time in. And then we go to with children. And then you can see in map increase gas is actually some amount of our time in this particular sample that we took. And you can also aggregate in lines, show in lines, and start really getting in the weeds with it if you want. Um, another neat thing that it does actually, let me, we'll go here. You can actually right click on it. You can see the source code side by side. If you propagate in lines, it'll often be able to show you like which individual lines of code you spent the most time on. And then when you click that line of code, it'll actually show you the machine code side by side, and it can show you how much time you spent on individual instructions even. So this, I found, has been a very powerful way to dive in and see what do we need to optimize, where we're spending our time, what's costing us, why, that kind of thing. Um, when it's able to, especially when it has more samples of the same code over and over, it can actually show you whether you're losing time because of branch mispredictions or just the sheer amount of time spent on that bit of code, stuff like that. This int map increase cache, this is probably a sign that something needs capacity set ahead of time, something like that, so that you're not uh, performing exponential back off allocations over or in a loop, something like that maybe. Um, so yeah. Uh, this is a very powerful tool. I found it extremely helpful for my performance work and uh, having it more deeply integrated so that we can have the Hoon side performance information side by side with the native Rust side has been extremely helpful. And uh, I just wanted to share that. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Uh, for future work, I do plan to figure out how to integrate the keep information for the memory profiling as well. So that'll be a next thing. Uh, Casimir, you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Chris. A few questions. Um, when you were showing it where it was able to jump right to the code and show the time spent or percentages, is yeah. that, do you have to do a debug build or can you do a release build with tracing on? Okay, so that's a great question. So uh, when we build things um, for production, generally what we're doing is our release profile is slightly customized from the, uh, the default. So what we do is we do opt level three, which is already the default for release profile. That's already the maximum level of optimization. We keep that the same. We do set code, unit, code gen units to one and we set LTO to thin. And that is, if you set LTO to true, you technically can get more inlining and link time optimization, but I found in practice that it doesn't help that much. And you get the same performance LTO thin, sometimes even slightly better. Cogen units is really what enables more uh, link time optimization because you're putting everything in one compilation unit, so it's able to kind of see everything all at once, basically, because you're not uh, linking in parallel. Um, the last bit is the part that I always set is I set debug equals one. So debug equals one is this really convenient uh, middle point between not having any debug symbols and having a strip binary and having full debug symbols. The binary is a little bit bigger, but I found that it generally, I, I just haven't found it to ever impact performance. I test debug zero sometimes just to like check, but the way the debug symbols get stored and mapped in the binary makes it so that they're not bloating your L1 cache or anything. Um, you still have the same kind of optimized code in the relevant parts of the binary. And what's nice about that is it makes so you can leave debug equals one just kind of enabled in all your production binaries. And then it makes it easier for tools like this to be able to map source code onto the uh, machine code. I will tell you though, Tracy has been uncannily good at mapping source locations onto machine code, better than any other profiling tool I've used. It's even better at it than Sampley, and Sampley does a pretty good job. So I'd say, yeah, you're gonna want uh, debug equals one, because otherwise, when you go to look at your statistics here, this will look like a bunch of machine code locations, you know, hex addresses, basically, if you don't have any debug symbols at all. 
but uh, debug equals one hasn't really cost us anything. And Tracy does a weirdly good job of this in my experience. Yeah, very helpful, Chris. And then just one more question for yeah. the open source people running your know, open source miner. How difficult, you didn't have to show it, but how difficult is it to get this working for their you know, miner? Uh, it's, it's not hard. So uh, basically, I can kind of run through real quick what I did here. So basically, when I built Notchain, it built release, features, tracing, and then, you know, then Notchain, right? And keep in mind, this isn't released yet. It's going to be released soon. And we'll include documentation when we release it, but it it will come out this week. I'm quite certain of that. And um, so first, you have the build feature. Then you probably have some kind of startup script or something for your server. You know, something that maybe you put in a system D unit to demonize the application. Those two things you're going to do there. Right? You're going to do export tracing neighbor equals true. So this environment variable set to true. And then in your arguments to your knock chain instance, you're going to include uh, trace tracing right there. I can actually double check it right here. Whoops, not the binary. There we go. Yeah, trace tracing. So you can see trace tracing and trace enable. And then uh, it does use the actual tracing infrastructure so your rust log is going to matter as well um you're going to want that to be granular enough that it's it's actually getting the emitted traces um the last thing that you're probably going to need to do is if you want the stack sampling which i do highly recommend it is extremely nice that's that's this part of the information this you'll get regardless the stack sampling will only work on linux and windows it doesn't work on mac os and to enable it on Linux, I did this right here. And this is something you have to do if you're using Sampley as well. Um, Sampley does have working stack Sampley on Mac OS. So if you don't want to run Docker, you might still end up using Sampley in that case. But I suspect just using Docker locally as a Mac developer and then using the Tracy client is going to be better. But um, yeah, this just enables you to collect the, the information that you need for the stack sampling. And if you do these things, it should work. Very cool. I'm sure that the open source miners are all going to like to use this and see it. And and hey, there's something where the Linux people are getting something that the Mac, it's, it's harder to get. Um, so Chris, thank you for showing us all this. Very informative. Yeah, thank you so much.